Uh, this is the last week of our Real Happy series, so I hope some of you got real happy in this last uh, few weeks. If you just showed up to church today and you're real sad, uh, check out our YouTube for the past few weeks. And uh, this coming, coming uh, Sunday, we're going to start a series called Fighting Shadows. I'm going to talk about the reality of hell this coming up week, so bring a friend. It's going to be amazing. Um, but today, I want to conclude this series um, where Jesus is talking from the Sermon on the Mount about the Beatitudes. And he said, blessed are those who mourn, uh, for they shall be comforted. And he gives these eight descriptive attitudes, but the word blessed really means happy. And a lot of Christians think, no, God doesn't want you to be happy. He wants you to be holy. And holiness is not opposed to happiness. What if happiness is the presence of God and you can be holy and happy? Amen? So today... Uh, I want to talk from verse 6 where it says, Blessed or happy are those who are poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Father, we thank you today for your Holy Spirit. Bless this time as we speak about happiness from your perspective. Bless each and every individual here. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen. You can be seated today. You guys are some clappers. I love it. <clears throat> where is happiness located? Because many of us have tried to find it this week. And if you've lived long enough, you probably found out that you can have moments of happiness in a relationship. But relationships are not all just happiness. And you can find moments that you get happy because you achieved something or got a new job or got a financial breakthrough. But happiness is not just by happenings or circumstances. Happiness doesn't seem to locate itself in temporal containers for a long-lasting period of time. The Bible teaches us and Jesus teaches us that to be happy is to be poor in spirit. It doesn't say to be happy is to be religious or the super spiritual, but happiness is in the area of our life that is infinite. In our spirit, happiness is a spiritual matter. But not just happy are the poor and happy are those who are spiritual, but happy are those who are poor in spirit. When Jesus is speaking to this audience, they would have known what true poverty looked like. And they knew in those times there was different classes of uh, people who made different amounts of incomes. And much like today, it was the upper and lower class. But in the lower class, there were two different sections. It was the ones who would live paycheck to paycheck. They called them peasants in the Bible, and they would just try to make it day by day and week by week. And the second word or class was those who were destitute. The destitute were the mentally ill, those who were the bottom feeders of society, who had no contribution to society. They were the beggars of those days who absolutely depended and were dependent on somebody else giving to them and were incapable of providing for themselves. When Jesus uses the word poor in spirit, he's not talking about the happy are those who live paycheck to paycheck. Can I get a witness right there? Amen. But he's talking about those who are destitute in spirit, who are completely empty and needy, depending totally on the grace of God as the source and strength of their life, who are incapable of providing their own salvation through all of their self-salvation projects, trying to save themselves every day. It, are, it is the people who are totally available to say, God, I know it was the blood, which simply means this, I know it's all because of the grace of God that I'm here today. It's amazing to see the grace of God at work in, in this body as a ministry. I met somebody this morning who had just got out of prison serving 18 years, was supposed to serve a double life sentence, and for the first time in 18 years showed up to church to meet their kids here, four of their grown children who hadn't seen them in 18 years. I know it was the grace of God. I don't know if anybody else has a testimony of it needed to be God's grace. It needed to be God's grace that brought me out. When Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, I want to 
cause us all to take a next step in some area of our life today. And I want to explain through three points what it means to be poor in spirit. Number one, if we're going to be poor in spirit and live an abundant life, we need to make space to serve. Just in case you didn't know, life and the world does not revolve around me and it does not revolve around you. And narcissism is not a leadership trait. It's actually a broken soul that needs the mighty grace of God to heal them deeply. It's not a gift of the spirit. Narcissism is not a gift of the spirit. This is not a serve us. This is a serve is. Life is about other people as well, not just fulfilling our own needs, but meeting somebody else's needs. And he said, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means I create spaciousness and availability to receive God's grace and to distribute it to others. There is margin for ministry in my life. Some of us have a ministry, but we have no margin, so we have no ministry. We have a calling and a gifting, but you know where real spiritual attacks happen? They happen in many different areas, but let me give you one area you might not be looking, in your calendar. If your calendar is totally full, your life might be completely empty. If it is dictated by distractions and running here and running, the devil runs to and fro. Children of God don't run to and fro. If you're sitting here anxious because you got to get to the next thing, you might want to say, Lord, help me with some margin for ministry in my life. The Bible says he gives grace to the humble. Why does he give grace to the humble? Because humbleness is not a performance, it's a posture. And the posture is availability that allows space for grace to occupy and make it about God and allow you to flow in the grace of God. Here's some suggestions that Jesus gives in order to empty ourselves for availability and margin. He teaches us, first of all, to pray. In fact, he models to us in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, very early in the morning. I used to think this was demonic, but apparently it's spiritual. While it was still dark, Jesus got up whew, and left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. You know what he was showing? Before the sun wakes up, I'm going to wake up because I'm not going to let the day set the pace. I'm going to let grace set the pace. I'm not going to be reactionary. I'm going to wake up and lead the way God called me to lead. Rather than letting life happen to me, I'm going to make it happen for me. So he got out of the house into a quiet place to be in union with his father. Some of us, we let the kids wake up before us. You know what's happening? The kids are leading the house because they're throwing Cheerios at your face. Cereal, cereal, go give me five more minutes. Now you got to wake up and give them cereal and be like, wake up, kid. I told you, wake up. Wake them up. Don't let them wake you up. I got three amens and one hallelujah. Make margin, lead your day because there is no ministry where there is no margin. The second thing Jesus taught us is he taught us how to fast. He said in Matthew 4, chapter 1, verse 2, then Jesus was led up by the spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Do you know what he was showing us? That whenever you go into a wilderness season, create space. Don't make pressured decisions. If you have to make the decision now, then it might not be a good decision. That's what manipulative sales tactics are. If you don't buy it right now, then you might lose the discount. And you end up paying twice of what you would have paid if you would have waited until tomorrow. Because you don't have to buy it now. You can actually go home and think about it and pray about it. I'm messing up some of the sales people in this house. I'm sorry. But grace gives us space and margin, and he's going to be tempted. But in his temptation, he has margin for the temptation. He says, hey, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. He's like, well, you don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I've already been walking with my father. I'm already aware of his word, and the temptation won't work on me because I have margin in my life. Some of us fall into temptation because we're tired and we have no margin. He teaches us to, to make margin by being and participating in generosity. Give your gifts in private and your father who sees everything will reward you. 
If you want to be able to, to serve properly, whether it's church or at your home or in your community, not only do you have to have a life that is set up with margin, but you also need to walk in the spirit of modesty. I know that's an old school term. When I was in church as a kid back in 1984, <laughs> um, what modesty meant was everybody should cover up, cover up their stuff and, and walk around and, and they were talking about clothes. Now, it's old school preaching, but it's not a bad idea. Now that I think about it, you know, when my grandma, she said, there's nothing uh, new that's true and nothing, and if it's true, it's not new. And, and they would teach that you should walk modestly, but not just in your clothing, in your lifestyle, in your speech, in your conduct. First Thessalonians 4, 11 through 12, in this loud life that wants to be rich, famous, and run as fast as it can, it says, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. How do I lead a quiet life? I'm glad you asked this because the Bible is so specific about it. It says, you should mind your own business. Oh, yes. And work with your hands just as we told you. You know why there's so much drama that follows you? It's because you don't lead a quiet life and you don't mind your own business and you don't do what you're supposed to do because you're telling everybody else what they should be doing. You don't live the Christian life you're supposed to live because you, you have a list of how everybody else is supposed to live and act around you and talk around you and dress around you. Mind your own business. I wish it was a fruit of the spirit. I, I, if, I, if you get nothing else from this message when you walk away, and people come to tell you that somebody's been talking about you. That's none of your business. Be flattered that somebody wants to talk about you on their off time. Mind your own business and you can live a peaceful life. And it says people will respect you and you won't need to depend on anybody. Because you're not dependent on people for your future. You're dependent on Jesus so you can focus on what God called you to do, who God called you to be, and you can serve people from a pure place, not thinking that they're going to get you somewhere that God can't. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business and work with your hands. Don't serve to be seen. Serve to serve. Don't serve because you're climbing a Christian corporate ladder. There is no Christian corporate ladder. There is just a cross where the flesh is crucified and Jesus is exalted. <laughs> Don't serve because you have an agenda. Serve because you have been transformed by the grace of God. You have been a recipient of God's grace and there's ministry that flows in your life. Serve because you're aware of what God has done in you first. If you don't know what God's done in you, you won't be good for anybody else. Be aware of others around you because life doesn't just revolve around you. And be intentionally aware of the presence of God that is present with you. In fact, today, some of you participated in karaoke as they said, it's nothing but the blood. And some of you participated in worship. And the difference was, that some of you were singing a song and some of you were singing with an awareness of the presence of God that was visiting you and touching your heart and you knew it was Jesus and you couldn't hold back tears because it was more than lyrics, it was more than music, it was more than lights, it was God's presence available with you and you were aware that Jesus Christ died for my sins and it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. To some, the cross is a fence and a stumbling block. But to others who know the revelation of the cross, that it, it was his blood that made me whole and made me new, it became worship because it was about the presence of God. It's amazing the way we treat the church because we treat it like an organization a lot of times we, we ask people to sign up for the usher ministry or the greeter ministry or the kids ministry. But imagine if we treated the, uh, our home like we treat the church. And you're like, hey, um, kids, would you like to be involved in the dishwashing ministry <laughs> to fulfill your purpose in life? <laughs> uh, would you, uh, so today, we're asking, we're in need of three people to do the, um, um, the, the lawn care ministry, and uh, we have a new mower so all the volunteers can be equipped for their ministry and for their grace. 
You don't do the dishes because there's a ministry. You do the dishes because you eat here and you're part of the family. <laughs> you don't serve to fulfill your purpose. You serve because it's who you are and you're a part of a bigger family and you're part of the kingdom of God and God has called you to serve. No, it's just not my thing. It's not my calling. Each of you have a grace on your life. And when you find out what that grace is, it is your mandate to serve it to the rest of the world. That's why Romans said in chapter 12, verse 6 through 8, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance to your faith. Now, I want, you, I want to tell you a secret. You don't have special gifts. You have access to all gifts. But it's according to your faith. So if you're only having faith to prophesy, then prophesy with all your heart, the Bible says. If it's to serve, then serve. If it's teaching, teach. If it's to encourage, then give somebody some encouragement. Because if you don't operate in your grace, you'll leave us with a bunch of grease. And you'll quit encouraging people and you'll become a gifted discourager. Some people, they say the biggest lies and I'm like, nobody will believe them. And a lot of people believe them. You know why? Because they have a gift to encourage. But they're misusing their gift and they're serving their gift in the spirit of discouragement. <laughs> Operating your gift or gravity will take it and use it for the flesh. If it is giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, then lead with all your heart and do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it with a smile on your face, not with a grudge on your face. Be happy about what God's called you to do and serve with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength because you're grace for it. You only get burnt out like candle wax when you operate in the flesh. But when you operate in grace, you get strength from serving because as you refresh others, you become refreshed. You're not a candle. You don't get burnt out unless you're in the flesh because the flesh fades, but the spirit gets stronger and stronger. And when you serve from your grace, you get stronger and stronger. We're called to serve because Jesus Christ himself in Philippians 2, 5 through 7 in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, which means he didn't leverage God's authority to be like, I'm God's son, I don't have to do that. But rather, he made himself empty by taking the very nature of a servant. I don't serve because I have to, I serve because I get to. I received the nature of my father. And, and I, let me encourage you. The, the, the way, this is for church folks. So if, if you're new, come back next week. We'll talk about hell. Anyways, <laughs> um, if they don't serve in this house, I wonder, I'm not saying it's not possible, but I wonder what their heart of service is in your house. If the greedy in this house, I wonder what your date night looks like. Hey. He emptied himself taking on the nature of the servant. This is when God uses us, not when we bring our gifts, qualifications, and resumes to him. But when we come empty and we say, Lord, I'm available, whether it's on my work, in my church, in my community, at my home, wherever I am, I'm available. Fill me continuously with your grace as I serve others. The miracle that Jesus did was the, the first miracle was at a, a wedding feast. And he told the people who were serving, can you get six water pots and bring those empty water pots? He didn't tell them to do anything but to bring empty water pots. Then they filled them and then he made them wine and he saved the best until last. And if you bring your emptiness to God, he has a way of filling it and making it better than you can imagine. The devil is a liar trying to keep you busy and burnt out and discouraged when he knows that if he can tap into that, he'll keep you from operating in your grace. But God has a grace in you, and you're going to get strength and encouragement as you serve other people. You're going to start smiling and not complaining. Ministry is not just a way of giving you another job. We all work too much already. But ministry is a, a, an act of worship that continues 
to let God know that I'm available, an empty vessel, poor in spirit, spacious. You are my priority, God. Use me for your glory. Number two, we need seed to sow. 2 Corinthians 9.10, and before I move on to make this more practically, uh, practi practical, um, we're having a Christmas service at the San Diego Rescue Mission. We're gonna have candlelights, we're gonna bring gifts. There's about 120 people that will be in transition, families, kids, everyone, and we're gonna bring them the love of Jesus. And we need people to show up and volunteer and pray for people, lift people up and, and, and serve people and bring gifts. And I wanna encourage you today to, to sign up, even if you haven't served this year, if you're gonna be like, let me touch my, my foot in the water, this is an opportunity for you to sign up today to be like, I'll do one time. And some of you are like, no, I, I'm ready. I could do two times a year. Do two times a year, according to your faith. Some of you are like, I'm an every week server. Every week serve. I'm not asking you to give your whole life to this church. I'm asking everybody to take a step and be who God called you to be. We want to encourage everybody to walk away today and say, Lord, I can serve, whether it's once a year, twice a year, or every week. That was an extreme, huh? Like what, once a month, how about that? <laughs> the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 10, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. He provides seed and then he provides bread for a great harvest of generosity, not for you, but in you, when you're serving and when you're sowing and when you're giving, you might be doing it for something, but you might not realize that God's not so much concerned about the outcome of what you get, but the income of who you become. And when you're giving and when you're serving, it is a way and tools that God uses to develop our character. We are not philanthropists. We are not volunteers. We are sons and daughters of God who are being shaped in the image of God. When we make space to serve, when we have seed to sow. Luke chapter 16 verse 13 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money, either Money serves you or you serve money. Either you try to make God serve you and be your genie in a bottle. If you rub him the right way, he'll do something for you. Or you serve God. You can't serve God and money. You have to serve God or money. The Bible speaks about mammon. And I want to tell you that the enemy always has a spiritual way of attacking physical resource. And one of the ways and one of the spirits that I want to call out is the spirit of mammon. Mammon is the love of money, but it works through greed and through a mentality of poverty. And a lot of times in church, you'll feel tension when the pastors talk about money. And there's a few reasons. Number one is because some pastors are greedy and want money. Can I get a witness? Not in this church, but a witness about other churches. We're gossiping. <laughs> <laughs> but number two, because there's so much shame around money because we all have stories of shame in the area of our finance. And a lot of times when you're struggling financially, that's when the enemy comes in to accuse you and to condemn you and, and, and to play with your mind and to play with your heart. I remember uh, as a child, um, there was several years that I never ate a school lunch because we didn't have the money I felt, at least I didn't ask for it. I felt that we didn't have the money for me to eat lunch and I was too prideful to ask for free lunch. I kind of still take pride in that. I didn't take their free lunch, worked for myself, everything I got. But that developed a, a shame story. It, it put the spirit of mammon in my life where I need to go justify my life. I need to make money. If something's going to happen, it's got to be by me. I, I'm the one who looks out for myself. I, I remember working all summer in Bakersfield, California, on top of a roof in school. <laughs> woo -hoo, I got a woo woo, yeah, from Bakersfield. In the middle of summer. And I, I saved up $400 because it was when minimum wage was like $5.25 an hour. And, um, and 
my, my mom couldn't pay the electricity bill, and I, I gave her the money to pay the electricity bill. We had an ugly house. I never let anybody come to my house because the cabinets were, like, falling down. We lived on a dirt road. The, 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 the floor was messed up, and I'd have people drop me off at my friend's house, act like I lived in a nice house, and walk to, the, to, to our house later. It's a couple miles, but save some face. But what that did to me was allow the spirit of mammon to minister shame. And I've seen so many parents go through torment because they can't afford to, to purchase their kids Christmas gifts. So they get in debt on credit cards in order to not feel the shame that they're experiencing. Look at wrap yourself up this year and give them a hug. <laughs> wrap that refrigerator and every time they open it, say Merry Christmas, God bless you. Wrap that door with a little, and just let them open it and be like, come on into your gift. Look what God has done. I've seen so many fathers feel like uh, the, the enemy attacks the fathers and condemns them and, and, and makes you, because, you know, I, like, as a man, we feel like we're supposed to be providers. And then when you can't do that, it, the enemy just comes in and says, you're worthless and, and, and drives them to substance abuse and all of these other things because they, they have so much condemnation. And the spirit of mammon starts attacking their life. The Bible says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And when you're invited to participate in generosity, you should never feel condemnation. You should give God praise. Your shame should not be the thing that is surfacing, but your freedom should be the thing that is surfacing. God has come to change the story of shame around your money. The enemy's goal is that if he lived causes us to live in shame, then we'll never sow. If he causes us to live in a poverty mentality and lack where we're always under need and under the curse and, and we're always surviving and we're always drowning, then, then the enemy will keep us from sowing under a lack mentality. If he can keep us in fear and afraid of who's going to be elected or what the economy, what's going to happen in the economy or the darkest days are ahead of us and depression, if he can keep us holding back in fear, that is the spirit of mammon. Ecclesiastes 11 says, cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days. It didn't say cast the seed. Imagine taking a loaf of bread and casting it in the ocean at La Jolla and coming back a year later and him bringing it back to you. You're saying, God, I'm releasing this because not only am I releasing this, but I'm releasing the fear that has me hostage for the future that you have for me. And so I'm not going to stay up in the middle of night, the night and worry about next month or this month or next week. I'm going to release it to you. You are my God. You are my provider. You have not given me the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. He wants to cause us to live in anxiety. So in Ecclesiastes verse 4, it said, he who watches the wind waiting for the perfect conditions will not sow seed. And he who looks at the clouds will not reap a hard harvest. And so we're looking for perfect conditions. I, I love uh, seeing young people, yeah, we're going to have a kid when we can afford it. <laughs> you know when that is? Never. You will never be able to afford. Inflation's going up. Those kids eat more. They're, 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 they're being born with like mustaches now. There's something in the cereal. They're expensive. They eat you out of house and home. You can never afford them. You can, you know what happens? You have a kid and you figure it out. You have a kid and you split the meal with them. You have a kid and you know what? Some of you thought you couldn't afford one. You ended up with four and you're still, you're still able to feed all those guys. Praise be to God. It doesn't make sense. It, it takes faith. It doesn't make sense. But if you're waiting for perfect conditions, we're going to get married when we can afford a house. You can never afford a house in San Diego. I, it was my dream as a kid. One day I will live in a million dollar house. Oh, the average house in San Diego? That's, that was your dream? That was your dream. Well done. You're, you're average. Give it up for the average people in the room. <laughs> Lord, he tries to get you waiting for perfect conditions. You know, if I have a million dollars, I'm going to give some to God. No, you won't. Because when you had a dollar, you wouldn't give anything to God. 
When you had $10, you wouldn't give anything to God because it's not about the dollar amount, it's about the mentality. It's about the spirit that tries to keep you bound, waiting for perfect conditions. Perfect conditions keep us from sowing seed and will never reap a harvest. Greed is what keeps us from sowing seed. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 9, but those who chase riches are constantly falling into temptation and snares, always looking for the next dollar, the next MLM, the next thing to sign up, the next Bitcoin. They are regularly caught by their own stupid and harmful desires, dragged down and pulled under into ruin and destruction for the love of money and what it can buy is the root of all sorts of evil. Some already have wandered away from the true faith because they have craved what it had to offer, but when reaching for the prize, they found their hands and hearts pierced with many sorrows. It's important that we sow, but we have to break the spirit of mammon on our life, on our generations, and on our families. We have to teach our kids to be generous. So you give in private, but in your house, that's private. So when you prepare to give, let your kids know that you're giving. Because if you're greedy, your kids are going to be greedy. If you're fearful, your kids will have a level of fear. But if you show them generosity, they will see generosity. My grandma, I learned generosity from my grandma. She was on a fixed income, and every weekend she would go and collect cans on the road to make up for her income. But what she was is a woman of faith. And she had nine children. And back in the day, this was a lot of money. Uh, still is a decent amount. But all nine of her kids made six-figure incomes. And, and she was on a fixed income. But what she would do is she would get the grandkids around when it was time to give. And she would have her envelope. And we would pray over it. And she would give us a generosity message. And she would tell testimonies of how God had provided. And one day someone showed up to her house and gave her all of her uh, mortgage money for the whole month. And she thought it was an angel. And she, she would start celebrating. And we would worship. And she would make a big deal out of generosity. Every one of those nine kids at some point in her life borrowed money from the fixed income lady. And every one of those kids lived in her house at one point in her life while they were adults. And she became the house for them. Because I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their seed out begging for bread. There is something powerful when you get the spirit, not the action or the performance, but when you get the revelation of how grace flows in generosity. This is what Paul said. Paul said, I work not only for my needs, but for the needs of others. Which means he didn't start off by saying, how much am I going to make this year? Because if you start off making the goal about you, you'll always fall short. But he said, how much am I going to make to meet the needs of others? Because if I'm willing to meet the needs of others, surely I'll meet my own needs. Because if my goal is how much I'm going to make this year, I might fall short. But if my goal starts with how much I'm going to give this year, I start in generosity. And I got a secret for you. Grace flows at the starting point of generosity. And maybe there's no flow in your life, so I want to invite you into generosity because there is where the river of grace begins to flow. Three people. It's all right. I don't need affirmation. My mom gave me a lot. There's something powerful about generosity I remember uh, we're having our heart for the house this December 8th, so you, you got an envelope today, and we want you to take that envelope and pray and, and make a pledge, and whatever God puts on your heart, and what, according to your faith, as the scripture says, according to your faith, do that. Believe something above and beyond uh, for this house. This is a special offering that we do every year. But I remember in 2012, my first wife had passed away, and I came to this church, and the, the, the pastor at that time, he said, what are you going to give for heart for the house? And he asked this question. I was sitting uh, somewhere on this front row. And the Lord said, I want you to give your, your first wife's wedding ring in the offering. I'm like, nah, Lord, how about I give some money? And I felt like the, the Holy Spirit was prompting me, like, what, what are you believing for? And I'm, I'm believing for a future. I'm believing for a mother for my children. I'm believing for a friend. I'm believing for a family. I'm believing for a life. I'm, I'm in this moment of grief, but I, I, I want to see a future, and I want it to look like this. And I felt like the Lord said, I, I want you, that's going to be the sacrifice. That's the one that's going to hurt you. And, and I took the ring, and I put it, and, and I sealed it. And when it was time for heart for the house, I gave the ring, and I regretted it every day since for eight years. 
I was like, Lord, I was supposed to give that to my kids and so on and so forth. And sometimes you're like, Lord, let's make this easy. Would a, would a 20 suffice? <laughs> And no, it's not about the money. I, I, I want to pull things from your heart. But when I gave that, the Lord said, I've released you from an old covenant. I've released something in the spirit. I've released something in the spirit that is making room for your future. If you sow to your future, you have to release something from your past. And I felt that day God broke the covenant and it broke my heart and it hurt. But I, I, I feel like that everything I saw in that moment and was believing for, God has more than provided. Me and my wife, we have five children now. God's been good to us in every way. I have no complaints. If I did, it wouldn't help to complain about them. But it is amazing. The life that I have, everybody knows it's because of God's grace. Everybody's like, how'd you do that? We all know that I didn't do anything because I'm not that good. God is good. Eight years later, um, eight years later, um, somebody came to me from the team and they actually brought me that ring back. I was like, oh Lord, he was just testing me. He was testing me. And they gave me the ring back. I, I felt like uh, Abraham was like, hey, go kill your son. He's like, nah, dude, I ain't gonna have you kill your son. You're crazy. <laughs> but it wasn't about me giving away jewelry. It was about God releasing something in the supernatural preparing me for my future. If anybody could ever get a real revelation of generosity, the spirit of mammon that's been on generations will break. And it won't be about the money you get. It'll be about the mentality you have and the, the Christian you become. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. As long as the earth exists, there will be seed, time, and harvest. There'll be a time to sow, and there'll be a time to wait, and then there'll be a time to harvest, and then there'll be a time to do it again. This first bucket represents our availability, and when we become empty and available, God fills us with his grace, and we serve others, not because we have to, but because we get to. How many are thankful that you get to be a participant and partner of God's grace? We pray, we fast, we believe that God has better days. And then you have the bucket where you got to sow some seeds. Now, this is how some of us sow. Lord, I'm going to try this. You're like, it didn't work. It didn't turn into a car. <laughs> I thought the pumpkin was going to become Cinderella. Like, okay, I'll try it again. I sowed a seed. And then you're like, but it never works. Look, it, it is not your job to look for the outcome. It's your job to sow the seed. He gives, that's why I never just sow one seed. Because sometimes that sucker ends up over there. Sometimes I'm, you know, one time I sowed a seed because my, my wife, she was, a, um, she was a counter on the county team. And I, you know what I mean? <laughs> sowed a big seed so she could see that I give. I don't think that one gave me fruit. But anyway. I got seed in the ground. I got people. I, I live in blessings and people do such great things for me. And I'm not taking credit for myself. But I'm like. Man, I don't know which seed that was, but I got seed in the ground. God gives seed to the sower. And when you sow those seeds, the Bible teaches this one virtue that's so hard, patience. So now you're like, Lord, please hurry. But you know what? When your kids are crazy, and you're praying for them, Lord, Jesus, touch my kids. Lord, save my kids. Bless my kids. Nothing's going to happen. Lord, touch my kids. Save my kids. Nothing's going to happen right now. They both look the same, but one has seed in it. So when my kids are crazy, I'm like, they'll be crazy for so long. But one day I got too much seed in the ground. When my son was getting high every day, I'm like, oh, it's all right. You got too much seed in the ground. God's too, too good to me. God's been after him. So God's going to, don't worry about it. 
I got too, I got too much prayers. I got too much, too much believing. I got too much watering that even if my kids grew up and lost their way, they'd be in the grocery store and somebody be like, are you a man of God? Because I got too much seed in the ground. Some of you are here because your grandparents had too much seed in the ground. Some of you didn't want nothing to do with church, nothing to do with God, but they had too much seed in the ground. They were praying before you around. They were believing for you. They were trusting God for you. They were watering and cultivating and believing over your life. But they had seed in the ground. Thank you, God, for a generation that believed in this generation. And we will continue to believe in the next generation. We will continue to sow seed for the next generation. Seed time and harvest. And then we get a harvest. And then sometimes we get a little self-righteous and we like to show our fruit. Yeah, I got... Got 13 disciples under me. More than Jesus had. He had 12 out of 13. Yeah. My core team, more than Jesus. But, but uh, this, this is fruit, but the fruit still needs to mature. Th this is fruit, but just because you got fruit doesn't mean you should stay planted. Some people get get some fruit and they're like, I could do this myself. I'm going to start my own church. Somebody told me, hey, uh, have you always wanted to be a pastor? I'm like, no, uh, you don't sign up for this one. It's like a special agency, like a heaven agency. They call you, you don't call them. <laughs> but once it gets to maturity, then you end up getting cut. But it, it's great because if, if the Lord cuts you, he knows you can handle it. That's why when circumcision happened, it happened on the eighth day because the eighth day is when vitamin K is released, which heals the, the blood from bleeding too much. So he doesn't cut you if he knows you don't have the wherewithal to be healed. So if you're getting cut, say, thank God I'm, I'm mature enough to handle cuts. That's why the Bible says, don't let somebody who's new to the faith be in leadership because if they are, they'll get lifted up in pride and fall into the condemnation of the devil because they look more like this than like this and they can't handle that. And then you get squeezed. Woo! And I want to show you what worship is. Worship is not you coming in and sweating, giving it all to God. Worship, this is what heaven's worship looks like. It looks like you enjoying God's presence. That's good. That's worship. No, no, no. It's not spiritual enough. God wants you to enjoy his quality of life. You know what worship is? It's not complaining but it's giving thanks and being able to enjoy his presence and the life that he's given you. <laughs> Worship is a lifestyle of letting God serve and love you. It's not that you loved him, but that he loved you first. And letting him serve you his life and you enjoying everything about Jesus. What is evangelism? It's about me running out there, we gotta reach the lost. Yeah, you gotta reach the lost but maybe in a different spirit. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. No one's going to your church. <laughs> Nobody, zero. I mean, it's possible. Yeah, I could use anybody. This is evangelism. You share. God's quality of life with somebody else. <laughs> Discipleship. We got to really teach them how to pray an hour a day. Well, kind of. Or you could just share his quality of life with somebody else. And let them enjoy. What a bad witness for somebody who's not enjoying the product they're selling. I want to tell people about Jesus. I hate serving here. Hey, come know Jesus. We need more volunteers. <laughs> Hurry. <laughs> Help. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, there's a new one. They're coming. <laughs> no, you're enjoying and rejoicing and giving what Christ has given to you. Evangelism is not a program. It's you sharing God's quality of life with somebody as he shared it with you. Discipleship is not a program and it's not more content, more literature. It's a lifestyle of knowing Jesus and walking in the fullness of who he is and letting his spirit lead and guide you into all truth and teach you and love on you and comfort you and build you up and challenge you and empower you to do all things through him. What program do I need to join? You don't need to join a program. You need to enjoy the life that you can receive today and share it with somebody else.